Thank you so much, Professor Catalano, for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to be here among so many wonderful friends and colleagues from around the world. Now, you may have noticed I am not here alone this morning. I am joined by my AI co-pilot and companion, Ave. Ave, it is a pleasure to be here with you as well. Thank you, Dr. Abramson. The pleasure is all mine. Excellent. Ave, I noticed we were both introduced to the lovely sounds of Mozart. Could you play just a little bit more for us, please? Certainly. Okay, I know what you're thinking. And yes, it is a bit cliche to begin a presentation in Vienna by playing Mozart. But this music is so beautiful and so inspiring, I couldn't resist hearing just a little bit more. And before we dive deep into this session, I'd just like to ask everyone here in the theater, what do you feel when you hear this music? Does it conjure in your mind an image of elegance and grace. Perhaps it fills you with feelings of serenity and tranquility. Maybe it calls to mind an image of nostalgia and introspection or romanticism and beauty. And I also wonder to myself, what does Ave feel when hearing this music? Well, let's ask. Ave, what do you feel when listening to this piece? Because I lack emotions or subjective experience, I do not perceive music in the same way humans do. When I hear this music, I first apply a Fourier transformation to convert the time domain analog signal into a frequency domain representation. I then decompose the component frequencies and I perform a spectral analysis. I am then able to summarize key parameters of this piece, including its form, melodic structure, and use of harmony. What a powerful illustration of where we are at this unique moment in our history. Human and machine, each having evolved to perceive the richness of music in our own unique ways. One with emotion and cultural depth, the other with unprecedented mathematical precision, each with its own significance and beauty. It is this emerging coexistence of human and machine, analog and digital, that so captures our imagination and propels our curiosity at this particular moment in time. Our culture is captivated by the transition of analog to digital, and this transformation is redefining the ways we think about the world, from the ways we move to the ways we build, from the ways we work to the ways we learn, and, of course, the ways we play. And it is certainly redefining the ways we think about medicine and healthcare. Of course, we in radiology, we have been at the very vanguard of the analog to digital transformation throughout our professional history. Indeed, that history is inextricably linked with the mighty narrative of constant technological innovation and relentless expansion of the analog digital frontier. Starting with the analog X-ray images of the late 19th century, progressing through the novel digital modalities of recent decades, through to digital image storage and distribution, and the remote access and interpretation of medical imaging via telemedicine. Well, now the analog digital frontier has undergone yet another step change expansion, this time intersecting with the realm of artificial intelligence. And we find ourselves mesmerized by the opportunities ahead of us and the challenges we may face. So let us now zoom in on the frenzied activity at the analog digital frontier. Let us explore some of the ways AI is being used in real-world clinical settings, some of the challenges we may face realizing the full potential of this technology, some of the questions and dialectical pull at that analog-digital boundary, and some directions we may go from here. 
We're all familiar with the background. Digitally acquired medical imaging at large scale, the perfect substrate for machine learning applications and insights. The potential was realized decades ago, and now research has translated into reality. Right now, in 2024, we see AI being deployed across the world in real-world clinical settings to address real-world objectives, enhancing care quality, improving care efficiency, advancing public health objectives, and addressing ever-present challenges with workforce, staffing, and morale. With increasing AI deployments, every day we see more and more examples of dangerous diagnostic errors and misses that would have occurred had it not been for AI acting in the background as a safety net, a second pair of eyes for busy and overworked clinicians. We see AI flagging time-sensitive cases for earlier diagnosis, accelerating time to treatment for urgent pathologies and notifying care teams of the need to mobilize resources. We see AI screening populations for infectious disease and early cancers and expanding access to care in underserved portions of the globe. We see AI deployed opportunistically to identify a range of chronic conditions for early intervention. We see AI helping overworked and understaffed imaging departments by expediting care, both in traditional workflows and in novel workflows that would not have been possible prior to the introduction of AI. We see AI intelligently triaging cases to subspecialists and substituting for the second reader in double reader workflows. And we see AI beginning to automate the drafting of reports for radiologist review. However, and still at that same analog digital frontier, we have the nagging suspicion that perhaps we have not yet reached our potential, and indeed that AI may not yet be living up to its initial hype. Let's get Ave to help illustrate with an example or two. Ave, could you bring up that case we were looking at earlier, please? This is a 50-year-old male who presented with right elbow pain following a bicycle accident. Ave, can you tell us what you see on these images? There is a fracture. Okay. Now, if I were to survey the audience, I would bet that a certain minority of attendees did not see the radial head fracture before Ave pointed it out. And for that minority of attendees, Ave has added some real clinical value. However, for the majority of attendees who did see the fracture, I would submit that Ave has not added much clinical value at all, besides simply confirming a pretty straightforward diagnosis. This happens to be my elbow. These images were from about a year ago. I was out on a bicycle ride, I took a hand off the handlebars to signal for a turn, lost control of the bicycle, very clumsily, I might add, went down, impact to the right forearm, went to emergency, they splinted my arm, told me to follow up with orthopedics. And when the orthopedic surgeon and I brought up these images, we spent about half a second deciding that, yes, indeed, there was a radial head fracture. The rest of the visit was spent talking about what to do with the fracture. Do we perform surgery? Do we opt for non-operative management? Well, the fracture is displaced a little bit from the joint space, enough that we would consider internal fixation, but not absolutely so. Besides, there's some new data coming in from Europe suggesting that non-operative management may be viable at this degree of depression from the articular surface. 
It's also an unusual fracture with a depression of the central aspect of the radial head, but preservation of a thin ridge of bone laterally. That thin ridge of bone may not be sufficient to support a fracture, across, a screw across the fracture plane. Uh, we may have to opt for a, a plate and screw fixation, which increases the risk of post-operative complication. Then again, with non-operative management, there's an increased risk of long-term arthrosis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the end, we opted for non-operative management. My elbow seems to be do doing okay. But my point here is that this entire conversation around treatment is one that current AI tools are not positioned to help with. Here, I'll prove it. Ave, what should be done about this fracture? There is a fracture. There you go. In general, AI is good at what it's good at. But the usefulness of the tool ends with what the tool has been trained to do. Meanwhile, physicians are able to draw from their collective experience, from their reading of the literature, from their understanding for the unique three-dimensional anatomy of the injury, and from their professional intuitions to come up with a holistic treatment recommendation. Well, I would say there are examples of this everywhere we look. So my own particular subspecialty training is in abdominal imaging and I spent years on faculty at an academic center working with our hepatobiliary surgical team on cases like this next one. Ave, if you please. Okay, now in this case, there are certain questions AI can help with and others where it most certainly cannot. Ave, is there biliary ductal dilation here? Yes, there is intrahepatic biliary ductal dilation. Great, and can you map that biliary ductal dilation for us? Yes, I am capable of mapping the dilated biliary tree in exquisite detail. That's fantastic. Now, can you just tell us what to do about the very subtle infiltrative cholangiocarcinoma at the liver hilum that's causing the biliary ductal dilation? Some common causes of biliary ductal dilation include obstructing stone, bile duct stricture, Ave. tumors, infection, uh, no, trauma, Ave. congenital conditions, and Ave. liver diseases, including primary that... sclerosing cholangitis and primary biliary cirrhosis. But Ave, that's not what I asked you. I didn't ask for a differential diagnosis. I am looking for a specific treatment recommendation for this specific patient taking into account the morphology of the tumor, its relation with adjacent structures, its genetic and molecular characteristics, and all available research data on downstream outcomes with different treatment options. I have insufficient data to fulfill this request. Ah, but you see, this is what a radiologist does. The biliary ductal dilation is not the cognitive dilemma here. The questions I used to spend hours discussing with our hepatobiliary surgeons were, does the tumor involve the right hepatic artery? Is the anatomy conducive to a vascular jump graft? Can we get away with a hemihepatectomy, or must we plan for a more extensive trisectionectomy? And what are the expected downstream outcomes of each treatment option? These are questions that AI, at least the AI of today, is not positioned to help us with. Thank you, Ave. It's not only inconsistent clinical value that may pull us in a more skeptical direction at the analog digital frontier. There are also more prosaic and practical questions about AI. The lack of reimbursement, challenges with procurement models, inconsistent regulatory frameworks, and difficulties proving return on economic investment over acceptable time horizons. Beyond these, we also have our own fears and suspicions. We, the radiology community, still look upon AI with much ambivalence and mistrust. Some of us because of a fear of disruption and replacement. Others because of quite legitimate concerns over uncertainties and risks the lack of transparency with these tools, concerns about patient privacy, fears about algorithm bias and drift, 
medical legal concerns, and a growing and very real sense of unease at our increasing reliance on technology and a potential erosion of human professional judgment. There are even more fundamental questions that must be answered before we can really leap ahead with this technology. Like, how do we define the standard of truth when evaluating machines whose capabilities begin to approach and even exceed those of expert humans? How do we compare AI-enabled versus traditional workflows when machine performance is measured in statistics and human performance is so often measured with intuition? And how do we define acceptable levels of risk when working with AI when we are so poor at quantifying the risks of working without AI? These are all excellent questions. Oh, thank you, Ave. Um, Ave, could you please pull up for us a graph of computational power as a function of time, beginning in 1970 and extending until today? Certainly. Thank you. The questions and tensions at the analog digital frontier will continue to challenge us over many years but I will raise some questions for us to consider here today. Starting with this, can there be any doubt that over the long arc of history and the shorter arc of our professional careers, the analog digital frontier will continue to expand? Can there be any doubt, given this trend in computational power, that AI capabilities will continue to increase? Can there be any doubt that over time, AI will be able to extract inferences from complex three-dimensional anatomy and correlate those inferences with accumulated experience and clinical studies to give us the kinds of probabilistic and personalized treatment recommendations that we seek, like for my elbow or that hyalur cholangiocarcinoma. Can there be any doubt that AI will marry this increasing computational power with ingestion of much more data, and many different kinds of data, structured and unstructured, imaging, laboratory, pathology, pharmacy, electronic medical records, from diverse populations and spanning diverse geographies? Can there be any doubt that AI will be able to extend computational insights across multiple biological scales, moving fluidly from information at the molecular and genetic levels through to the tissue, organ, organism, and population levels, and back again. Can there be any doubt that AI will get better and better in the areas where it currently struggles, at diagnosing rare diseases, at providing insights into multidimensional clinical problems, and, yes, at automating certain activities, and intelligently triaging those cases that require human involvement. Already we see the writing on the wall. Every day, a new newspaper headline, a new press release, a new landmark publication illustrating the speed with which the analog digital frontier is advancing. We cannot stop the expansion of the analog digital frontier, but we can help nudge that expansion in the right directions, and here is where I believe we must focus as a specialty. We can start by engaging as clinical experts to define the problems still in need of solutions, whether they may be the tedious, mundane tasks that can be safely automated, thus allowing us to frame-shift our attention to those activities requiring our full cognitive effort, or those truly vexing diagnostic problems that will require modern computational power and enormous data sets to address. We can work with developers to understand what AI must learn and how, particularly where that learning must be supervised and constrained and where it can be stochastic and organic. We can work with policymakers to advance sensible regulatory and procurement frameworks 
that incentivize adoption of the right technology at the right pace for the right reasons and to keep patients safe while promoting access to technology that improves care. We can champion science over rhetoric. We can advocate for common performance standards and for creation of large, independently curated data sets for testing and evaluation. We can evolve our vocabulary so that the language we speak is that of long-term downstream patient outcomes rather than short-term surrogate metrics. And we can shape for ourselves, for radiology, an appropriate long-term professional identity as the ultimate guarantors of diagnostic integrity and the ultimate information integrators of the diagnostic ecosystem. To many of us, the most intriguing question at the analog digital frontier is whether one day that frontier could disappear altogether and the boundary between human and machine could evaporate entirely. Ave, do you have a sense for if and when that might occur? I have insufficient data to answer that question. Me too. It's a question filled with promise and dread but it illustrates the mind-warping potential of the journey ahead of us. For now, let's ensure that we are taking that journey together, that we are engaging collaboratively as a professional community to be the architects of our shared destiny. I believe, and I hope you do too, that the future is bright, that we are heading into a world where technology will continue to enhance our ability to take excellent care of patients that with our guidance, the analog digital frontier can be advanced sensibly, safely, and responsibly, and that in the coming years, together with our machine counterparts, we will indeed make beautiful music together. I'd like to thank Ave for being here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Abramson. It was a pleasure being part of your plenary lecture. I hope to see you all again very soon. Same here, Ave. A special thank you to the conference organizers. Very special thank you to the uh, production department, especially Christian Barelli and Johanna Cruz. Uh, and to everyone here, thank you so much for being part of this experience. Enjoy the rest of the conference. So uh, I think this is even better than the open ceremony, if possible. Uh, I really express my, want my express my gratitude to you uh, because I think you opened up a new frontier in uh, radiological conferences. My idea of having next generation radiology was meaning also to have next generation conferences, if possible, or at least seeing our profession and expressing what we feel for our profession in a different way. And you really have absolutely achieved it. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. On behalf of the entire radiological European Society. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.